Hi, everyone. This is uh, Matt Horn from the Penman Institute. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're just going to wait uh, another 30 or 45 seconds before we get started. There's a few more people joining, so just hold tight and we'll get going in just a minute. Hi again, it's, uh, it's Matt Horn. I'm the Associate BC Director with the Penman Institute. Um, so this is our, our fourth and last in our Climate Leadership Plan series of webinars. Um, so thank you very much for joining today. Hopefully we can provide some useful information to folks on the overall process and then sort of the specific topic today around sort of what would the sort of climate leadership plan mean for BC's economy? How can we take advantage of some of the opportunities and how can we manage some of the risks? Um, so joining me today is Nancy Olaweiler from Simon Fraser University, who is also, um, with myself, uh, a member on the climate leadership team. So she'll bring some of her economics expertise and also some of her perspective from the, the climate leadership team. Uh, Nick Rivers from the University of Ottawa, who's done sort of piles and piles of research on carbon taxes generally and BC specifically that he's going to be able to share with us today. Um, and then Dale Bugin from Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, um, the sort of relatively new organization so that's doing some really interesting work on um, ecofiscal policies generally and um, specifically around carbon pricing. Uh, just before I get started here, I wanted to make sure I acknowledge and thanks and support for the, the sponsors for this series, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, the Sitka Foundation, Van City, and the Shine Foundation. Uh, so just in terms of outlines, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of an overview of the Climate Leadership Plan process and the Climate Leadership Team recommendations and sort of a, a narrower subset of those specifically around the, the fiscal policy recommendations that came out of that team. Um, Nancy will just uh, take a minute or two to provide some additional perspectives on that from um, from her spot as also a member on the climate leadership team. Then turn it over to Nick to give a, a rundown on some of the environmental economic evidence that's emerged from the, the first um, eight years of BC's carbon tax. Um, and we're going to talk, we're going to shift gears into sort of a subset of that with, to be sort of uh, so-called emissions intensive trade exposed sectors, which featured pretty prominently in the climate leadership team's discussions and recommendations and make it a uh, really important and interesting opportunity for the province and the country going forward. So um, Nancy's going to start off giving a little bit of the climate leadership team perspective on why those are in there and what the, they mean. And then <clears throat> we'll turn it over to Dale to close the round of presentations. Um, sharing some of the research that they've done on carbon pricing and competitiveness pressures in Canada and BC specifically. Uh, we should get that sort of wrapped up in um, hopefully sort of about 20, 25 minutes max to give lots of time for a question and answer. So just quickly in terms of CLP process, um, we are, I guess, nearing the end of the I guess the, the second consultation the province is running. So I would first just encourage people to engage in that process. Um, either formally through the through the providing comments into the government, engaging with your MLAs wherever you sort of have connection with this is an important opportunity to really let the province know that this is an important step that people want to see the province take and lots of I think details to sort out, but um, I think an opportunity and a value encouraging the, the province to move ahead. Um, so that, that sort of formal window app wraps up March 25th, so end of next week. And um, we'll share a few resources at the end of the presentation around that. But um, sort of going forward from there, the province has promised they'd have the climate leadership plan sort of finalized by the end of the spring. So it's sort of the window of time we're looking at. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just to sort of refresh people with the mandate the climate leadership team was given. So this was a, a committee established last April to give the province uh, recommendations on next steps on its climate strategy. Three key um, pieces to the mandate. One was achieving BC's climate targets. Two was maintaining a strong economy. And the third was mitigating impacts on vulnerable populations. Um, so I think uh, just commenting quickly on sort of where the package of recommendations we provided to government gets. Um, the, the longer term, I think we do quite well on the climate targets front. So there's a, a pathway there that does get the province on track for deep cuts and its uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the shorter term, we, we, uh, we definitely fell short in terms of being able to provide recommendations that meet the province's 2020 target. There's a, a fairly substantial gap there. And the, the reality, unfortunately, is the province had an ambitious target when it set it in 2007 and um, hasn't implemented new climate policies over the last four or five years, which left us in a situation of not being able to close that gap. So I think we've, 
um, provided recommendations that do get the province back on track, but there's a there's a short term gap there still for sure that um, I think as a team we decided which wasn't plausibly you couldn't plausibly close that unfortunately. Uh, in terms of maintaining a strong economy, I think the recommendations do very well. They have sort of uh, again, this is based on modeling, looking forward to the policies, but sort of strong projection of economic growth, sort of out through the time frame we looked at to 2050. Um, a slight, slight sort of uh, less growth, slight amount less growth than sort of a world without climate policies, but again, in these models, we're not looking at the impacts of climate change we're trying to avoid, so that sort of 2.07 per year uh, percent growth as opposed to 2.11% growth. It's a, it's a pretty good bargain relative to the cost of climate change we're trying to avoid. And then in the last one, mitigating the impacts on vulnerable populations built into the recommendations are measures to increase protection for low-income households and also northern and rural households in the province. And just, there's good recommendations to address that front as well. Um, so I'm going to dive specifically into sort of just giving a summary of the, the fiscal policy recommendations. So this is one section. There's um, other sort of uh, sections in our report that dealt more specifically with transportation and buildings and um, lots of material out there on those. We're going to focus more specifically on the fiscal policy recommendations and the, the big one that has generated lots of conversation is this idea to start increasing the carbon tax again. Uh, the recommendation was to start those increases by $10 a ton per year starting in 2018. Um, also a recommendation to expand the coverage of the carbon tax, so to go from the Sort of combustion of fossil fuels, which are mostly covered by the carbon tax, accounting for about 70% of the province's emissions, to include those non-combustion sources from industrial processes, parts of the natural gas sector, a number of little bits and pieces that could increase that coverage up from 70%. And then the big question from there is, what do you do with that new revenue? And we, we did wrestle with that and came up with a, a balance of pieces that um, uh, did sort of uh, work as a compromise or a, a compromise package for the, the team. So the first was to reduce the PST, um, as I mentioned, increasing protection for low income and northern and rural households. Um, I won't go into this one at all in detail at this point, but a recommendation to establish measures using carbon tax revenues to protect emissions intensive trade exposed sectors where there are competitive disadvantages because of climate policy. Um, and the last was uh, establishing mechanisms to um, improve investment both in sort of technology and innovation and also projects at a community scale to help reduce emissions. Uh, so that's the, the package and um, two questions I received a fair bit on those that I'll just sort of proactively answer. So on the, the last one, so this idea of investing some of that money in climate solutions, get a question, so why not why not spend more of it? I think there's 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 definitely a I think a pretty legitimate perspective. It's a way that we should be maximizing that investment in, in the climate change solutions. Um, this was a consensus process on the climate leadership team process, so we, we were tasked with both meeting those objectives and coming up with a, a package of recommendations that worked for all of us. Uh, so what you're seeing there is a, a compromise that uh, did work for the entire team, and I think um, there's representation from different sort of segments of BC society and BC industry that um, gives some uh, give some power to that compromise as a good blueprint for the province to move forward. Um, the other question we do get a fair bit is sort of why reduce the PST and if you're going to be reduced taxes, why not other taxes? And um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but it was one we spent some time wrestling with and looking at um, reducing personal income taxes, reducing corporate income taxes, um, and sort of on balance looking at the, the evidence from the modeling, we're going to get sort of um, more bang for the buck in terms of reducing PST relative to other taxes and also um, improving some equity outcomes as well. So that's the, the summary of the recommendations. Just to show quickly what those look like from a timing perspective, um, we've got uh, a recommendation provided to government end of last year. Um, we were uh, recommending that they make decisions and announce those decisions on sort of next steps in the carbon tax and what to do with the revenue this year. Um, so there's sort of plenty of advanced warning and people can make, make changes and plan for that appropriately. Uh, the first schedule of carbon, new carbon tax increases would start in 2018, and the carbon tax coverage would expand in 2021, and then finally a, a recommended review period um, to sort of look at what the next schedule would look like. And then the, those sort of that revenue package, we didn't get to the point of saying this revenue, this revenue piece of this amount in this year, um, generally saying that those sort of new carbon tax revenue should be matched with the expenditures over time. So that's what I was going to use to cover it off. Um, I'll turn it over quickly to Nancy at this point, just if you want to add anything else on the, 
climate leadership team process or sort of the recommendations of the fiscal policy package. Thank you, Matt, and thank you folks for uh, being on this call. I think Matt summarized it well. I'd just like to highlight two points and then we can delve more deeply into some of the issues uh, with your questions. But number one is the, the objectives that we were given by the provincial government in setting up the climate leadership team, we took very, very seriously. And looking at the recommendations, I just encourage everyone to not view any of them in a piecemeal way. You have to have the whole package to see both the ability to reach the target. Putting it another way, if we don't have the package, we cannot reach our legislative targets. Number two is that, as Matt said, this is a consensus. We did not have the opportunity to flesh out every single one of our recommendations in detail, but we think it's a really good starting point for moving forward. And as he said, the, the CLT, the team, consisted of people from First Nations leaders, municipal leaders, industry folks, academics, environmental uh, organizations such as Pembina. And this was a, a really a great process where if you can get those kind of people in the room to come up with what we think is a viable and dynamic plan, then we'd be very excited to see this plan come into fruition in some way and to get folks support for it. But I'd be happy later on to talk about anything like why the PST and what, what, why not further other tax cuts. I'm happy to talk about that. But I'd just like to end before turning it over to Nick on, Nick will probably talk a bit more about this. BC has flourished. We lead the country and have led the country in growth. If you look at the current growth forecast going forward, BC is supposed to be number one. I'm not going to say our climate leadership plan in the past is responsible, but I can say pretty much unequivocally that it has helped strengthen our economy. It has moved us toward thinking about the future in terms of technology and substitutes for our carbon emissions. So we want to keep the momentum going, and the climate leadership team felt very strongly that we have a package to do that. I'm done. Turn it over to Nick. Thanks, Nancy. Um, yes, Nick, there you go. Over to you. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for, uh, for listening. Um, so as Matt said in the introduction, I've done a, a bunch of studies on this uh, BC carbon tax. I was excited when it came in. I lived in BC at the time because it's it's one of the the few carbon taxes in the world, and as you know, as a as uh, an environmentalist, I was excited about it from an environmental perspective. As an academic, I was excited about it because it gave us a really neat chance to study how these carbon taxes that we all talk about actually work in practice. And so this presentation will draw from some of the work that I've done and some of the work that others done others have done uh, that tries to evaluate what the effects of the carbon tax have been over its first few years of implementation. So uh, just a couple of points about the tax. I think probably this is familiar territory. Uh, it was implemented in July 2008. It covered all combustion greenhouse gas emissions in the province. And so when Matt talks about expanding the coverage of the tax, it's especially to cover greenhouse gases that arise from non-combustion processes. But this was a tax that was levied equally on all sources of combustion greenhouse gas. So anytime someone burns a fuel, they pay a tax on it. Um, it, it started out at $10 per ton of carbon dioxide and increased in a steady rate, a steady way, up to $30 a ton of carbon dioxide by 2012. Uh, and this, as I'm sure many of you know, works out to about $0.07 cents per liter on gasoline, so somewhere between a 5 and 10% increase in the price of gasoline. Um, the, uh, one of the features of the tax when it was rolled out was that it was designed to be revenue neutral or approximately revenue neutral. So right now it raises about a billion dollars per year in revenue for the government. And all that revenue, if you look through the budget in any year in BC, is used to offset other taxes. Um, and so uh, roughly a third of it goes to reduce personal income taxes and to provide, uh, more recently, to provide tax credits against personal income taxes. Uh, closer to uh, a little over half of it goes to reduce corporate income taxes and again more recently some of the broad corporate income tax reductions have been replaced by targeted corporate income tax um, exemptions and then there's a, there's a part of the tax uh, revenue that's withheld to co provide compensation 
for low income and northern and rural households with the intent of making these uh, perhaps vulnerable populations whole again. Um, as a result of this tax rebating process, BC now has amongst the lowest income taxation in Canada, both for corporations, it has the absolute lowest uh, corporate income tax rate in Canada, and as well for individuals earning up to $75,000. And so, you know, when you think about this tax, you should think about it as a tax shift, not about as a, as a, as a net new tax. And because of this process that has a lot of desirable features, it's, it's relatively simple, it's, it's cost effective, it's, uh, it seems to be environmentally effective, it's basically the textbook uh, kind of climate policy that a lot of us learn when we take our first environmental policy, environmental economics class. Uh, so the, uh, the OECD has actually referred to this as a textbook environmental policy. It's the kind of policy that we recommend in textbooks. Um, so you can go to the next slide. My, uh, my interest over the last few years, one of my interests in, as a researcher has been studying the effectiveness of this tax. And so uh, this is a, uh, a slide that shows gasoline consumption in BC, that's the red line, and in the rest of Canada, uh, that's the blue line, and you can see this divergence that happens after the, the, the tax is brought in uh, between Canada and the rest of uh, uh, BC, sorry. And so using kind of this type of method, but in kind of a more formal way, there's been a bunch of research to try to assess what the effects of the, of the tax has been on gasoline consumption, on natural gas consumption, uh, and on people's behaviors. And I think the, the research is starting to coalesce around estimates of around a 5 to 15 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions that are due to the tax. And so this would be kind of a statistical finding. And encouragingly, it's backed up by findings from the kinds of simulation models that Matt had talked about being an input to the, uh, the climate leadership team process. And so, you know, sep completely separate kind of strand of evidence suggests, uh, again, that this type of tax should reduce emissions by somewhere around 5 to 15 percent. Uh, um, and so I think we've got some kind of triangulating evidence that suggests that this tax is likely to have been environmentally effective. Go to the next slide. Um, and then speaking to one of the points that, that Nancy raised is this concern, of course, that we have that when we bring in environmental policies, we want to be really sure that they don't have a tr they don't have this trade-off that's associated with them. We want to make sure that, that a new environmental policy doesn't compromise the economy. Um, and so one of the, one of the things that, that economists like about this type of approach, this carbon tax approach, is that it seems to be cost effective. It provides consistent signals to emitters to reduce their emissions. Um, and so they think it shouldn't have a big impact on economic growth. And indeed, the preliminary evidence out of BC bears that, bears that, uh, that theory out. If you look at growth rates in Canada and BC, over the period when the carbon tax was being phased in, BC was growing faster than Canada. Um, again, looking forward, as Nancy said, it looks like BC will continue to grow faster than Canada. More formal uh, econometric analyses, statistical type analyses suggest very limited impact of the carbon tax or no impact of the carbon tax that's discernible in statistical data. And again, using other sources of evidence, these model-based simulations uh, I've worked with suggest, again, that there's very little likely economic impact from the VC carbon tax, uh, that it's, you know, a very small negative or very small positive, but certainly close to zero. Uh, so again, we've got this nice triangulating evidence that suggests limit, very limited environmental impacts from the existing carbon tax. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, obviously this is a very quick presentation, but I think uh, we can draw a couple of uh, conclusions from the tax experience in BC. BC went through this kind of bold experiment at the time in environmental tax reform, and we've learned a few things. Uh, I think one of the things we've learned is that environmental tax reforms can be effective, can be part of the solution to addressing environmental problems. We've seen real greenhouse gas reductions in BC associated with this tax. Um, the second thing I think we've learned is that modest uh, environmental tax reforms, like the one that BC went through in, from 2008 to 2012, can be implemented with little or no aggregate economic cost. And again, the data and the modeling estimates that come out of BC suggest there's really no discernible economic impact associated with the tax. Um, and then the third thing I would say is a very general lesson that comes out of BC is that if we're aiming for deep greenhouse gas reductions, uh, we require a much higher carbon price than currently in place in British Columbia. And so uh, I think this is the, the, the source for the, 
recommendation, the main recommendation that came out of the climate leadership team. So Matt, I think that's all I have to say. I look forward to questions from, uh, from, from the audience. Thanks a lot, Nick. So we'll get to questions after a little bit more presentation. Um, I guess first of all, we're just before we get to Dale's presentation, I wanted to turn it back to Nancy briefly just in terms of any commentary on, so we're, we're going to take a sort of dive into emissions intensive trade exposed sectors at this point. So just uh, Nancy, some of your perspectives on why this is sort of an issue that's sort of featured in the climate leadership team recommendations and some of the principles we agreed upon as part of those recommendations. We can't hear you yet, Nancy, if you're still on mute, so. Okay, am I, can you hear me now? We can, yeah, great, thanks. Okay, sorry, I thought I'd punch the button. Um, as Matt said, one of our core objectives was to ensure that we would accommodate and uh, deal with any competitiveness issues that would arise if BC's policies get out ahead of the rest of the world. And as, as Matt and Nick have said, we are ahead and proudly so. But the rest of the world is catching up. And uh, lots of exciting things going on all over the world, China, India, uh, states in the United States, and of course Europe. So our principle on what we call the emissions intensive and trade exposed sector, those are the industries which are GHG intensive, in other words, they contribute a fair amount to the GHG profile of the province, but they're heavily engaged in trade, which means that for many of them, they do not control the prices of the goods that they produce. A prime example would be, of course, the energy sector, where we all know what's been happening over the past year with uh, very, very low prices, quite sharp declines in the world price of, of oil and in the North American and other markets for natural gas and natural gas products. Canada, BC does not control any of those prices. We are subject to the forces of, of national and international supply and demand. But that does mean that some of our sectors, forestry sector would be another one, are vulnerable to those sorts of conditions. What we're, what we're targeting in our principle is how much does the carbon policy regime affect those industries differentially than what is already facing them in their world markets. So as Nick said, there's very little evidence that the existing BC carbon taxes had a big impact negatively on any of our, of our sectors. The aggregate data certainly does not show that. And um, Nick's work and others show that even in sectors that you might think are exposed, it hasn't been that significant. So the question is going forward, if the climate leadership team's plan, comprehensive plan is adopted, would that put any of our industrial sectors at a competitive disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis their trading partners? And that's why the principle of looking for areas of support, looking for programs and provisions that take into account any differential in the carbon regimes are what we felt very strongly on the climate leadership team is a principle that we wanted to, to establish. We are members of the climate leadership team are continuing to work on that issue along with uh, folks such as, as EcoFiscal and others to, kind, to, to sort of uh, look more intensively at what those measures could be. How would we implement them? We've got some great examples from what we've already done in BC for some of our sectors to ensure that the carbon policy still incents them, still provides an incentive for them to reduce their emissions, but does not put them at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis their competitors who are not facing the same carbon regime. But I'll just end on the note that we expect this to be, we have principles for it, high-level principles, targeted, which means it's specific to the sector and their needs, transparent in that folks can see why and what is happening. There's no secret deals going on behind. It's all open and transitional as the rest of the world catches up to our leadership. And we think that's going to happen very fast. And we, we like to thank EcoFiscal, Dale, for uh, also having the same format. We've, we've, we've adopted it and embraced it because those are the principles, the broad level principles we're using to go forward. 
But I just want to reiterate that we feel very strongly that we want a climate plan to provide the incentives to reduce emissions at the same time keeping our economy healthy. And we believe that that's totally within the realm of possibility with good policy. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so, Dale, over to you and just to dive into this a little bit more deeply. Great. Thanks, Matt. So, EcoFiscal put out a paper last fall that took a closer look at this competitiveness issue. So, who is affected by these pressures of a higher carbon price in one jurisdiction relative to others? So, this isn't all carbon cost, all cost of policy. This is very narrow definition of competitiveness of just exactly what Nancy's talking about of this, this higher carbon price at home relative to trading partners. So we care very much about honing in on exactly who is exposed to these pressures, both in order to assess how big a problem this is as we move forward with more and more aggressive carbon pricing policy, but also to identify where we might target the support and how we might define that, that targeted Mentioned that Nancy mentioned in terms of, of uh, removing and ameliorate, ameliorating some of these competitiveness pressures as part of our policy design. So, the analysis you're seeing here is a look at sectors in BC and it uh, draws on, on data based on models uh, but takes a look sector by sector at both of those dimensions that Nancy highlighted. So, on the vertical axis, you see carbon intensity, or essentially, we have carbon costs as a share of a sector's contribution to GDP or a sector's value added, assuming a $30 carbon price. And so the higher a bubble is, that is the higher a sector is on this figure, the more carbon intensive it is. And so the greater carbon cost that sector has as a share of its, of its, um, its total value added. On the other axis, the horizontal axis, we have trade exposure. So this is the extent to which uh, sectors are competing in traded goods that, that are traded internationally. So essentially they can't pass on their costs because there is a North American price or a world price for their commodities. So the further right you are on this figure, the more trade exposed you are. So that means when you put those two things together, the further you are to the top right, the more vulnerable you are to these competitiveness pressures as a sector or as a firm. So we see up in that top right quadrant, some of the classic EITE, emissions intensive trade exposed sectors, like cement manufacturing, like refining, like lime manufacturing, aluminum manufacturing, natural gas, coal mining. Uh, now, all of those aren't exactly the same levels of pressures, but you can see them, them clustered up there. It's important to notice a couple other things as well here. Um, one, you'll see a big, giant bubble, a big share of both BC's GHGs and of BC's GDPs in the bottom left. That's services, government, transportation, a bunch of other sectors kind of aggregated together there. But the key point there is that they are neither trade exposed nor emissions intensive. So they have low carbon costs and they are mostly doing business only within BC and not competing against firms outside of BC. So those kinds of firms have very little, very low competitiveness pressures as a result of carbon pricing policy. It's, it's, it's most of the economy, in fact, that is not really strongly affected by these competitiveness pressures. Uh, one last thing that's not on this figure, and that would be a liquefied natural gas sector, because it doesn't yet exist. If it did exist in BC, it would probably be up in that top right corner as well. Uh, one final piece, I guess, uh, we've shown emissions here. So the emissions intensity number is a function of all of the sector's emissions, so it's both process emissions and combustion emissions. And of course, the current BC policy covers only the combustion emissions. So things like cement are actually a little higher than maybe they should be, given that carbon pricing policy in BC, that carbon tax, doesn't cover all of the cement sector's emissions. Next slide, please. So two things going on here. First of all, we want to draw some thresholds about who really is above a given threshold for emissions intensity and trade exposure, and thus qualifying them as more exposed or less exposed. And to define those thresholds, so defining where in the upper quadrant meets the, the standard for being more exposed, we've drawn on the rules established in 2008 for the American Cap and Trade Legislation, the Waxman Markey Bill, that didn't end up actually going anywhere, but, but defined some very clear, transparent, explicit definitions 
uh, for sectors that would meet both those criteria. So that's what we've used here as well. The second key piece is comparing BC to the rest of Canada. So you can see that when you when you draw those thresholds, only a very small share of BC's economy is actually vulnerable to these competitiveness pressures. It's not to say that it isn't important for those specific sectors, but it's not a huge issue for the economy as a whole. The scale of this issue is not an economy-wide one. It is a very narrow, very targeted issue, and that's exactly why both the Climate Leadership Team and EcoFiscal have arrived at that conclusion of, of making support targeted rather than broad. There's just not a need for broad support uh, to address competitive concerns because those issues are so narrowly targeted. Uh, there is, of course, some variation across provinces in Canada. You see much more significant exposure in provinces like Alberta and Saskatchewan uh, with the oil and gas sectors that are emission pollutants are exposed. Uh, so this this is a bigger issue for provinces like that, and you can see how it has led to different kinds of policy designs uh, in the context of Alberta's recent carbon pricing policy. Much stronger focused attention on that competitiveness issues, given that it's a, a bigger issue there than it is in BC. Next slide, please, Matt. One last slide for comparison. So those numbers before assumed that $30 per ton was was static and fixed. But how would the threshold change if we started to move up that price? If, if BC, for instance, moved ahead with those climate kind of leadership team recommendations to start to increase the stringency of the carbon price in BC, how would that change the share of provincial economy and provincial GDP that would be vulnerable to these competitiveness pressures? Well, you can see there is some variation, and BC shows more variation than, than many other provinces as you, you move up. But number one, it's it's not a huge step. There's still a very sm relatively small share of the economy that's vulnerable, even at very high carbon prices. And two, the sensitivity is not that strong. We've seen it a little bit, but not that much. Provinces like Saskatchewan or Ontario move almost not at all as you move that price up from 30 to 60 to 90 to 120. And that's a function really that that the emissions intensive trade exposed sectors tend to be very emissions intensive trade exposed. There's not many sectors that are kind of in the middle, that are just a little bit, and that as you boost up carbon price and therefore the carbon costs of those sectors, it doesn't really change which sectors are, are then meeting your threshold. It does, of course, change the level of carbon costs for those sectors that, that are still exposed at higher prices. So they may have greater pressures. It doesn't change the scope or the scale of the problem in the context of the economy as a whole. It's, it's still the same sectors that are vulnerable. So just to circle back to where I started here, again, number one, we have are kind of illustrating that this competitiveness issue and its carbon pricing isn't a huge issue. It's a narrow issue rather than a broad issue, even at higher carbon prices. And that leads directly to that, that targeted recommendation for support. Uh, this also provides some early thinking about how you could transparently define how some of that support is is provided to these vulnerable sectors and these vulnerable firms. And just to build on Nancy's point, it's really critical that you don't provide that support by exempting them from the carbon price. You don't want to, to shelter them from these costs by just exempting them from the policy altogether. Instead, you want to tie, provide support that maintains their incentive to improve their emissions performance while removing their incentive to respond to that price by shutting their production down. You, what you don't want to do is just drive production to some other jurisdiction with weaker carbon policy uh, and then leading to no real impact on global GHGs and not solving the problem while BC bears the costs. So the good news is that there, there are good ways to design policy to address that concern if that is your issue. And the recent Alberta policy, as I noted, uh, is notable in a lot of ways in how its focus for industrial policies is is exactly this, to provide them with incentives to reduce emissions, but to remove the incentives for them to, to reduce emissions by just shutting facilities down, reducing output. So good policy is, is the way out of this challenge and the way out of providing that, that narrow, targeted, transitional uh, support to these vulnerable sectors. And that's good for me, man. Thanks a lot, Dale, and thank you again to <clears throat> Nick and Nancy. So we're going to enter the sort of question and answer session of this. So on the uh, 
the right hand side of your screen, or at least it is for me, you'll see sort of the little webinar box. There's a, a questions tab there you can click and type in questions. Uh, so uh, here Pemmin is going to sort of moderate the question and answer session. So he'll read those out and direct them to one of the, the four panelists. Um, just as we're sort of starting to collect those, um, uh, just a couple resources here for people that sort of as we're moving forward in the, the climate leadership plan process. So as I said at the beginning, the, the formal government comment period is open until March 25th, so the end of next week. Uh, the link to provide your comments uh, is there. Um, also, if uh, you're looking for any resources on that, um, PEMIT has already put forward um, our submission to that plan, so that's the third link there. Um, the climate leadership team recommendations, um, with um, some of the other team members, we pulled together a summary of those. You can look at those if you want to get a better sense of what's in there. And the, um, the full set of recommendations is also linked from that document. Um, and finally, just relevant for this comment, for if, um, any businesses that are joining on the webinar today, we've been working with the Board of Change, Clean Energy Canada, Clean Energy BC, and Climate Smart on a, a letter from businesses in support of next steps in the carbon tax so aligned with the climate leadership team recommendations. So the, the link for that is there as well if you're interested in learning about that. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Max to start handing the, the questions. Thank you, Matt. Yes, everybody, so we'll um, get the Q&A going now. So if you have any questions, please enter them into the dialog box that Matt had mentioned on, under the questions tab. And uh, we will also be conducting two or three polls in the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so we'll give you guys just a minute for questions to come in. Here's one question. The first question came in and it's for Dale. On Dale's last point about the policy of emission intensive industries, curious, curious about the details of the policies that incentivize emission reductions while not driving them to another location. And that's from Arjan. Dale, can you take a stab at this, please? Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, the technical language people use is typically something like output based allocations. And I will explain a little bit what that means. I'm also going to start by talking about this in the context of a cap and trade system and then translate it to a carbon tax just because it's easier that way. But let me tele telegraph right away that it could work in, in either world. Uh, and Nick may want to chime in on this afterwards too. Uh, but the idea is in a cap and trade system, you can give permits away for free in that cap and trade system. And that doesn't undermine the stringency of the policy because it's still a fixed number of permits total. But the ones you, you, that, you, that you have to define the cap, you can give away for free based on the output or the level of production for a given firm. And essentially, that creates a signal, an incentive for those firms to continue to produce. So you have now have two incentives. You have a price on carbon that creates incentives for emissions reductions. But you also have a second policy, essentially, that is an incentive for production. And those two things together mean that there's a really good incentive to improve your emissions intensity, so improve how many emissions you produce per unit output, uh, but not to just shut things down. That translates in a carbon tax world through something like an output-based rebate. So you are using revenue from the carbon tax to provide that production subsidy, that incentive for output that complements the carbon price, the incentive for emissions reduction. So it works, it works in both worlds. Thank you, Dale. Um, we have another question come in, and that is, um, you mentioned that the carbon tax has had not much of an impact on BC's economic performance, but we know that to decrease our emissions, the carbon cost will have to be much higher. What will be the impact in the future when the carbon tax is, let's say, five times as high? And uh, could I ask Nick to take a stab at this question? Okay, I think that's a good question. Um, first of all, I'll say, we don't have a lot of empirical evidence of carbon taxes five times as high. Um, and so there are few jurisdictions in the world that have had this clean kind of natural experiment that BC had where they brought in a new carbon tax and didn't also reduce all kinds of other energy taxes. 
Um, and so there's not, I would say there's not much of an empirical basis for making claims about that. We can use the kind of model-based simulations that I talked about. And so these are the kinds of economic models that, uh, that are used for public finance questions, for example. And when we run uh, an economic model with a much, with a, you know, a, a significantly higher carbon tax, like a, say a hundred dollar ton carbon tax, um, we do find a larger impact on economic growth or on, econ on the level of economic output. But I would say, you know, I would characterize it as very small still uh, compared to the size of the economy. And so uh, if you're thinking about um, the economy growing at an average rate of say 2% a year or 2.5% a year, you might see the growth rate in the economy shrink by 0.05 or 0.02% relative to that 2%. And so rather than growing at 2% a year, you might see it grow at 1.95% a year or 1.96% per year uh, if we had a $100 a tax in, if we were phasing up towards a $100 a ton tax. And so eventually you'll get to the point where the economy is a little bit smaller, but in terms of growth rates, which is how we kind of experience the economy, it doesn't look like it, it, will, have a, it will have a dramatic impact if we go to a, a carbon tax that's, that's, say, in the realm of possibility, like $100 a ton, um, if we go, if we try to completely decarbonize the economy, get to zero emissions with a carbon tax, I think we don't really have the empirical basis either from models or from uh, from kind of statistical type of evidence to make claims about that. Max, can I add something? Please, Nancy, go ahead. Uh, the one thing the models do not incorporate, because as Nick said, we're, we're looking at simulations and trying to predict the future, it does not incorporate technological change that is underway. It does not incorporate the growth in technology and sectors that changing the relative price of carbon in our products will enhance fully because we just we just don't know those so forecasting out a large number of years just want to caution that I, I don't want to be overly optimistic but nor should we be too pessimistic and I mean Nick has quite clearly said that the effects are small given the pace of technological change those could be even smaller it's just it, it's not here one thing to add as well it's not captured well in the models, and I touched on this briefly at the beginning, is sort of the, the costs of climate change we're trying to avoid. And so these models typically sort of look at a, a no new policies scenario and a scenario with your climate leadership team type recommendations and compare and contrast those two different scenarios. We, we know we're on track for um, pretty dangerous levels of climate change if we don't sort of dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally. And there's a whole bunch of sort of economic, um, environmental, and social costs associated with that dangerous climate change. So those are those are what we're trying to avoid. We don't. It's very rare to see those built into these sort of models. So there's um, that's sort of another element that I think sort of pushes a, a positive towards the, the ambitious climate um, policy. Thank you, Matt. And as you can see, Stephen has um, started the first poll question. So if you can take just a second to fill out one of the, uh, these poll questions by choosing one of the answers. And um, in the meantime, we'll get going on our next question. And it is, does BC have any mechanisms currently in place to protect the competitiveness of EITE sectors from the extra costs associated with the carbon tax? And may I ask Nancy to take a stab at this question? So sorry, could you repeat the first part of the question? I heard the last part. Of course. Does BC have any mechanisms currently in place to protect the competitiveness of EITE sectors from the extra costs associated with the carbon tax? Oh, yes, we do. I mean, first of all, as Matt said at the very beginning, we have the revenues from the carbon tax have been used to cut things like the corporate income tax and personal income tax. BC has the lowest corporate income tax in the country. Now that affects all firms who are paying tax equally, but it's important to note that we are very competitive on tax rates. Number two, as per the discussion that, that Dale had and that I started, the targeted policies include a, uh, a targeted and time-limited policy for our cement sector. Uh, cement faces, as, as Dale's bubble chart shows, cement faces some significant uh, competitive issues. 
So we've already got a policy in place, which was uh, determined by the provincial government in consultation with the with the industry, and and that serves as a good model for going forward if we get the package introduced. So there's some. Uh, there are other sort of specific exemptions and specific policies. I, I would note that uh, in our climate leadership plan, if we if we get into the details of some of the sectoral stuff, we we proposed in the plan to deal with some of the upstream, to deal with the upstream emissions. But one of our accommodations is to give them time to get in the monitoring and the leak detection equipment and also some significant change in the way that those, uh, that oil, that the gas is being extracted, in other words, electrification. So I think it's really important to look at the whole package of things. There are many different ways that we can make the transition less bumpy and make it quite smooth for different sectors. And as I said, they range from lowering their taxes. The PST cut would be something that businesses told us over and over again. You know, this is, this is not a tax we like because we can't deduct it from going forward. So it's everything from taxes to specific programs to looking at the regulatory environment and phasing in uh, new policies, giving time for transition. So, you know, it, it's, we're very cognizant of the need, but I think I want to just keep re-echoing that we've had these policies in the past and we fully hope to have them in the future that make the, make the transition as smooth as possible. Thanks. Can I add something quick to that? Please go ahead. So, uh, just to build on, on Nancy's response, um, there are these broad measures like the, the tax reductions uh, that were built in place when the tax was first implemented. And then there were two particular measures that were kind of responses to, um, to industry complaining that the tax was an unfair burden on them. And so the first one we saw was in the greenhouse sector, the greenhouse growing sector, and in the broader agriculture sector. There was a uh, exemption made for certain sub agricultural sectors like the greenhouse sector, uh, which complained of this being a big this tax being a big burden on them in particular and then the agriculture sector as a whole became exempted from all uh, taxes on diesel used on farm. Um, the second policy or the second uh, mechanism that was built in to to uh, to promote competitiveness of these energy intensive sectors was on the cement sector and uh, it was just brought in a, a year or two ago and it was this phased transition rather than an exemption it was a policy that encouraged or, or subsidized the development of new new low greenhouse gas technologies in the cement sector and so these are very different types of responses this one's an exemption one's a technology subsidy Dale's already mentioned that exemptions aren't the appropriate tool for this. It takes away the incentive for greenhouse gas reductions in the sector. But I think on a more concerning level almost is that both of these were granted in a uh, in, in not the kind of process that the climate leadership team has recommended. In other words, it wasn't transparent why these sectors amongst all the sectors that were potentially exposed were granted the reprieve. It wasn't, it looked like it was, you know, in one case it was, um, it looked like a kind of a lobbying type response that, that the, the greenhouse sector was effective at, at pushing their demands above other sectors and got, got a particular response. And so I think it's really important, first of all, to get the mechanism right, and secondly, to have this clear, transparent process uh, to, to justify whatever kinds of special treatment that, um, that sectors should get, because every sector can come up with a reason that it should be treated specially on any kind of policy. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nancy. Um, also, you can see the results of the first poll that came in, and it's roughly evenly split bet between people thinking it is predominantly an economic opportunity for BC and it's an economic opportunity and a risk for BC. Um, I also encourage you to keep asking questions. Oh, and there's a second poll coming. Also, please ask you to fill this out. And I also encourage you to keep asking questions. Our next question is, um, here it goes, have the competitiveness recommendations proposed by the climate leadership team encouraged emission intensive and trade exposed companies to, to support the team's proposal or have they generally been more oppositional to it despite these concessions? And may I ask Matt to take a stab at this? <laughs> 
Um, thanks, Max. It's, it's a good question as well. And I think there's definitely been a, like a not as fast as I'd like, but some shifting conversation um, in the province from some of the, the sort of more emissions intensive trade exposed sectors. And as Nancy mentioned, like there's, there has been some ongoing conversations from the climate leadership team process around like how do you take that set of recommendations a, a step uh, more detail in terms of how they could actually work. And um, that's been a mix of sort of academic voices, NGO voices, and industry voices trying to figure that out if it is workable still in a consensus model. Um, so that's, I think, the, the positive side of it. I think from a, I think, a bit of a frustrated perspective, we still, um, I think if you look at uh, some of the sort of industrial voices in the province, um, not looking as sort of forward-looking as I, I would certainly prefer them to. And I think there's a, a package of recommendations here designed really explicitly to sort of understand and sort of manage competitiveness concerns where they exist. Um, I, I would, I'd like to see sort of more conversation and sort of more of an embrace of that approach from industry in the province. And we're, we're not quite there, but it is a, it's a conversation that does seem to be shifting a bit as well. Thanks, Thanks Matt. Um, when we go to our next question, and it is, is there a vulnerability charge for the anticipated natural gas exports in the future as projected by the BC government? And Dale, you had briefly touched on it in your, in your presentation, but I wonder if you could elaborate on this quickly. Uh, can you re just repeat the question, Ray Max? I missed the first part of it. Of course. Is there a vulnerability chart for the anticipated natural gas exports mm -hmm. in the future as projected by the BC government? And basically, is an LNG component in your chart? Yeah, so I, I don't have data for it because it doesn't exist. Uh, you you could build it into the model and calibrate the model uh, to try take a good shot at what what that sector would look like on those two dimensions. Uh, I don't know precisely what it's going to look like, but I think it's very likely that it would be definitely in that upper right quadrant, as I noted, just because so much of that gas would be exported, that LNG would be exported, and it is a fairly emissions intensive process. So that does depend a little bit on how it's uh, how it's made and the nature of those processes. And uh, Nick and Matt might have more to say on the specifics there. It's Matt here. I can just add a little bit on that question. And it's um, it's um, it's a challenge that we don't have sort of the real data, but even looking at the proposed projects, um, definitely not all LNG projects are created equally. And you can see a big range even in the ones that are proposed in BC. So. Um, the Pacific Northwest LNG project, which is the Petronas, back one has been in the news because it's sort of in the middle of its environmental assessment process. Um, quite a high emissions intensity. We could look at the LNG Canada proposal back by Shell, I think about 40% lower than what uh, the Petronas would be. And then um, the wood fiber LNG project, which is a smaller one near Squamish, um, 70 or 80% lower in terms of greenhouse gas emissions intensity. And that's um, around sort of what technology choices they're making in terms of energy efficiency, waste heat recovery, and how, many, how much electricity they're using as opposed to using gas. So there's it's a big range just even within that sector in terms of what new projects today are proposing to do. Thanks for that, Matt. And as you can see, we also have the results in from the second poll, and it's um, roughly equal support for the first three options, not very low, and then very overwhelming support for investing in infrastructure and clean technology. So that's very interesting. So thank you for participating. And uh, the next question, sorry for that. The next question is for Nick, and it is, I would like to hear Mr. Rivers respond to, if he's aware of it, Mark Lee's recent criticism of BC's carbon tax. And um, if you could also, if you're aware of it, uh, quickly tell us what the criticism was. Um, I'm not sure I can fill in the blanks on that one. Uh, I can take a shot if you'd like. I think he's, he's concerned about the revenue neutrality. Is that, is that right? There's a more recent one, Nick. Um, okay. so I think last I'm, not, week, I'm not aware of it. Let, let me try, and then you can you can chime in after I fill in a few holes. You probably have more to say. Okay. Uh, but Mark's Mark's assessment of the impact of the BC carbon tax in terms of GHGs looked at GHG trends over a historical period. So it looked at how GHGs have changed since 2008. 
and in an attempt to parse the impact of the policy. And I, I argued with Mark on Twitter about this uh, because I suggested that what he was doing wasn't really the right way to look at the impact of the policy, that he needed to compare what emissions would have been in the absence of the policy, what economists call it counterfactual, rather than just those, those time over year, year over year changes. There's lots happening elsewhere in the economy uh, over time, and, and looking at those time series alone doesn't really isolate the impact. Uh, so to me, it wasn't a really fair assessment of the impacts of policy. Uh, Mark rebutted that he, he essentially didn't trust any models, estimates of a counterfactual. Uh, but since that's next domain, I'll let him chime in at that point. Okay. I mean, I guess I've seen a bit of this argument in the past. Um, if you look at the, for example, I've looked at gasoline demand in BC. Um, and if you look at gasoline demand in BC, uh, you can see after 2008, gasoline demand, when the tax was phased in, gasoline demand doesn't decrease all that rapidly. It certainly doesn't decrease all that rapidly relative to historical norm. And so this is the kind of, uh, I think this is the kind of evidence he's using to say the carbon tax wasn't effective. And I think just like Dale's saying, the, the crucial thing is to think about what the counterfactual is. And so we've, we're looking at the period just after the carbon tax was brought in as a period when gasoline prices and energy prices generally all decreased really rapidly. And so we know from lots of other evidence, hundreds of studies, that people change their gasoline consumption, their natural gas consumption, when the prices of those commodities change. And so you kind of have to think about how those price changes have affected or would have affected or did affect the, uh, the consumption of fossil fuels in BC during the same period when the tax was brought in. And so this is this counterfactual thinking. And there's a couple of different ways you can do that. And, and I mentioned a couple in my talk. One is one that's, that's used a lot by statisticians is to try to, is to try to parse out all those other factors that are, that are affecting um, that are affecting gasoline demand and natural gas demand in BC. So for example, changes in prices, changes in people's preferences, change in the kind of cars people are buying, um, changes in the amount of income they have. So this would be a statistical type approach. And we did that in our studies by comparing BC to other provinces and controlling for things like prices and controlling for things like incomes and investments in public transit and that sort of stuff. And then the other approach to establishing a counterfactual is to build one of these economic models. And these models require lots of assumptions about how people respond to price changes, for example. But they're an alternative approach that, that requires a different set of data. And in our case, in the case of BC's carbon tax, these two approaches, which require very different sets of data and different types of assumptions, are yielding roughly the same kind of impacts. Both of them uh, do force you to create this counterfactual to think about what BC's greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions and fuel consumption would have been without the carbon tax. So it's not just this simple before after the carbon tax kind of comparison, but actually a more rigorous construction of a counterfactual exercise. Thank you, um, Nick and Dale, for that. So um, the one thing I would just sort of add to wrap up on those, and I, I sort of followed some of that debate on Twitter as well, is that where there's definitely not disagreement would be sort of on the steps forward. And I think whether it's sort of using the approaches Nick is talking about or sort of the starting point from Mark Lee. Um, if you're going to, if BC is going to have success reducing carbon significantly as it's legislated to, to happen, it really is, it's going to need stronger policies. So I think I, I would tend to agree with the evidence that there has been a, a positive impact uh, of the carbon tax. If we're sort of looking at the, the targets that the province has set, that policy and a host of other policies have to get stronger, uh, significantly stronger over time, which is where the climate leadership team landed as a group. Um, so we're at time. Um, I wanted to, again, thank uh, Nick and Nancy and Dale for participating. Um, hopefully this has been useful for our audience. Again, just a quick thank you to the, the Real Estate Foundation, the Sitka Foundation, Van City, and the Shine Foundation for making this possible. And um, yeah, once again, just a last encouragement to engage in the process and um, hopefully sort of get this to the other side of having an ambitious climate leadership plan in the province coming into the spring. So have a great day.